Hi folks. So September came and went pretty fast. I didn't have quite the same stressy end to the month as I did August. Um, I just about had enough time. Although the final book was slow going as you'll find out in a minute. I had four days to finish Sirens of Titan which seemed like plenty of time for a book that's only a couple of hundred pages long. But as I'm recording this, I haven't actually quite finished it. I've got another 40 odd pages to do, um, which I will probably finish today. And if I don't, I might just DNF, which gives you some indication of what I thought of it. So in reverse order then, Sirens of Titan by Kurt Vonnegut. Vonnegut's one of those authors like Philip K. Dick that is held on a pedestal by many science fiction fans but I so far anyway based on the limited number of their books that I've read I just don't get them. Philip K Dick is boring and um, this um, Vonnegut book was was pretty pointless and that may have been what he intended. So we follow the protagonist whose name is Malachi Constant um, is the son of a, a rich guy who's who stumbled across a, an investment method using the Bible, which which makes him extremely wealthy. Um, in fact, Vonnegut teases throughout the book about religion and um, the, the last section, more or less, of the book is a bit of a satire on religion in general, actually. So. Uh, we follow Malachi at firstly um, with his initial his initial interactions with Wilson Rumford, who is the other sort of main character, although he only appears sporadically in the book. Um, so he's been flown through or into in his spacecraft. A chron I'm going to have to read it on the back because it's a bit of a mouthful. Chronosynclastic infundibulum, which is a which is just a, a thing. It, it, Vonnegut does go into some detail to explaining why it's called that, but. It doesn't matter. Anyway, he's, he's converted into a sort of quantum wave function, effectively, and he um, and when his waveform intercepts Earth, then he materialises, um, and that's uh, every fifty nine days he he appears as if by magic um, at, at, at his home in Rhode Island. So he has plans. So as part of his um, interaction with the infundibulum, he now knows everything that will happen exactly what will happen when it will happen to whom and when and where so he's he's um, all knowing in that he's not omnipotent or anything but he's all knowing in that respect so that allows him to um to act in whatever he thinks is the best interests of of, of either himself or everyone it's not really clear so anyway malachi meets this guy and rumford sort of confidently predicts that malachi will end up on mars and he'll have a baby or a child with with a woman Rumford's wife, I think, if I remember rightly, who's kind of disgruntled with him disappearing um, and only reappearing once every 59 days. So uh, Malachi's like, I'm not going to Mars, what are you want about? Anyway, he gets taken there somewhat against his will, is effectively press ganged into what eventually becomes an invasion force of Earth. So a bunch of people from Earth are taken to Mars, their memories are wiped and they're drilled into um, being... Um, a pretty hopeless invasion force when they actually eventually do i don't think i'm giving anything away um by saying the whole exercise is pointless or meaningless because they'll the nearly all of them get nuked um on the approach to earth malachi however um and his and his buddy um the, the ship that they're on either they fly it somewhere else or it flies itself somewhere and they end up on on mercury deep underground in a cave system with some aliens that sing uh, and they only sing one note, but um, and they but they really like music. So so Malachi's mate, whose name I forget, has uh, for some reason has some records with him. So he, so he sets up um, or tape. So he sets up his tape player and plays the music, and they really like it. Anyway, they're not really central to the story. It's it's there's a common theme. It's sort of pointless and meaningless. Um, that whole section, I was, I was thinking, what the fuck is going on here? And to cut a long story short. Or to cut a short story short, um, he um, he ends up back on Earth, and he's he's like a messiah figure. At the point that I've got to, not quite at the finish. He's he's like a messiah figure for the religion that Rumford's established, which, if I remember rightly, is called the Church of Christ the Indifferent. And it's replaced all established religions on the planet, um, as Rumford predicted that it would, and um, and Malachi is its sort of central figure, um, for for reasons which I haven't yet got to in the book. And my my overriding um, impression of this, well, before I get to that, the, the best thing that I can say about this book is that the style of Vonnegut's writing reminded me a bit of Joseph Heller's uh, writing in Catch-22. It's slightly absurdist, quite rapid fire, 
um, dialogue. But but my overriding impression was that this book was was as pointless as the narrative uh, was. And um, frankly, I didn't enjoy it at all. So um, I'm going to um, reserve judgment on Vonnegut in general. I've only read this one of his books, and there are a lot, obviously. Same for Dick. I've only read two of his books, and there's a whole bunch. So I'm not going to reject either of them out of hand for the, in this case, pretty mediocre experience, and in the case of the two Dick books, slightly lacklustre. Um, I do feel like I might just not be getting it. I'm not tuning in for some reason, or maybe it's just a kind of style of science fiction that I just don't like. And um, and and fair play to those that do. But so this one, I, I think four out of ten, uh, I thought it was a bit shit. Okay, next I'll probably be struck down by science fiction lightning for saying that, but but that's the way it goes. Uh, next up was John Wyndham, The Crack and Wakes, and um, I did review this on the channel. Uh, it it was a bit of a bait and switch. The the picture on the front implies strongly implies that there's a, like a giant squiddy octopusy thing that that takes down ocean liners. There's nothing of the kind. It's an alien invasion story. At the beginning, there are sort of flashing lights in the sky, and um, these red meteors kind of zoom into the sea and disappear into the deepest parts of the ocean. And the story is told through the eyes of a husband and wife journalist or writer couple who by slightly circuitous means end up telling the story of this inv this what later becomes apparent is an invasion and the sort of developing and escalating stages of it because it's it's through their eyes and they're not they're not really directly involved it does feel a little, you you feel a little bit removed from the action and as i said in the review that's kind of fair enough because anyone that was close to it's kind of dead because because that's the way they roll um favorite part of the book was the final kind of quarter or so um where the um, invading alien ocean dwelling beings have realized that they're, they're not going to be successful confronting humanity dead on that humans have kind of got the got their number in terms of how to defend themselves against them um, at least from a kind of direct coastal attack so anyway the aliens have figured it out and gone okay we're not going to do that we're going to do this instead and they and they melt the ice caps essentially causing the water level to rapidly rise so the last section of the book whereas previously the journalist couple um, were sort of reporting um, at arm's length on the action and, um, you know, in, in quite a sort of stiff upper lip British style. In the last quarter of the book, we sort of find them uh, in, in, the, in a motorboat that they've stolen, <laughs> uh, sailing this boat along one of London's main streets, trying to find somewhere safe to stay. And they, and they end up in the countryside uh, at a house on an island. And... Um, just try like everyone else trying to survive this thing because because the 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 land all across the world has been inundated lots of people have drowned or died and um, society's broken down it's gone anarchic and chaotic people are uh, looking after themselves and their families and damn everyone else and um, your standard sort of post-apocalyptic scenario uh, and right at the very end there's a um, there's a glimmer of hope that that some kind of order might be being restored for the for the very few people that are left um, I enjoyed it. I like Wyndham's. I haven't read a huge number of his books, but I like his writing style. Um, it was a bit dated, but it was written in the early 1950s, so it's not a huge surprise. But but in general, I I, I really liked it. I forget what score I gave it on the um, on the review. I think it was a, a six or a seven or something. So next is a bit of a toss up between this one and the next one, but but I'll go with this one next. Avon Avon votes the Voyage of the Space Beagle, which is a a, a short pretty fleet book and I was struck throughout the reason I read this is because I reviewed Bob Shaw's uh, Ship of Strangers a month or two back and uh, lots of people told me that, that that was a that was based on or was a homage to uh, this the Space Beagle uh, and also that, that this book had influenced m many things including um, Star Trek and the movie Alien and a bunch of other things so I was keen to read it um, I read it it's good it's my first A. Van Vogt book I enjoyed it. Sort of episodic, there are four or five maybe um, sort of main things all involving encounters with one kind of alien or another. So the, the Space Beagle is like a, a massive thousand man science and exploration vessel. It's spherical, it's got lots of decks. Bear, bear in mind that this was written in the 1950s. It's 1950s bureaucracy on a spaceship. So there are, there are, there are memorandums, there are um, committee meetings, there are strict hierarchies, there are heads of division and um, there's a political kind of angling for influence. One of the main characters goes from being a sort of 
grumpy chemist to being wannabe leader of the of the scientific expedition and he's he's eventually kind of goes a bit batshit crazy and um, will stop at nothing to um to establish full control and he goes a bit a bit totalitarian on them but anyway there are there are four encounters i think four encounters with aliens of varying shapes and sizes and with varying and increasingly difficult to manage abilities um, which really test their scientific know-how and uh, and their ability to defend themselves ultimately in some cases there's a sort of cast of characters but the the one i suppose the most the most interesting ones are so kent is the the guy the chemist who goes batshit crazy towards the end and then a guy called grosvenor who's sort of there on sufferance he's um his science isn't a proper science uh, 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 as far as the other science the, the kind of traditional scientific departments the likes of um astronomy or astrophysics and physics and chemistry and biology that they they are pretty sniffy about um grosvenor's science <coughs> and i actually forget what it's called now that's not very helpful is it okay i found it so it's called nexialism so he's the professor of nexialism on the ship and he's got he's got his little department with his lab equipment and essentially uh, it, the principle of nexialism is that you synthesize all of the other sciences um, so that you've got a kind of across the board holistic view of what's going on so you're not looking at it through the lens of physics or just chemistry or just astrophysics it's a, it's a combination of the few and it seems to give them sort of unique insights it's almost like um an informatics or or analytics engine that, that's not available to um to the other scientists and um and he comes up with some pretty u- unique insights at the beginning of the book everyone's ignoring him uh, including the captain and the um scientific director and um but he gains more and more influence as the book goes on he ends up being a counterpoint to kent the chemist the chemist that goes batshit crazy towards the end and their sort of interplay between those two is quite good in a sort of quite restrained bureaucratic kind of fashion so uh i enjoyed it i can i having been told um i can see where the influence came from for alien and for star trek there are obvious kind of parallels and i enjoyed the way these kind of alien encounters and the way that they handled them was interesting and um you know i'm always up for a first contact uh type story but more interesting for me was the was the interplay of the characters and the the arc of kent the chemist who becomes sort of pretty petty sort of dictator type person and the arc of grosvenor the uh, uh, with the quirky new science that no one no one gets or understands and uh, no one um that everyone's very skeptical about uh, and i enjoyed that probably the most out of everything in the book um like i say the, the alien encounters and the way that they the the way that um van vogt sort of conceives those and the way that um they outsmart and outthink and um just by dint of their capabilities kind of outfox the the scientists on the ship um is pretty cool and uh, in various different ways with varying degrees of peril involved um I, so i quite liked it i don't know if i can put a number on it uh, it's probably a seven i think you know it's pretty good i enjoyed it certainly um it hasn't put me off far from it reading any other of the many other a van vote books that i have on my shelf so that's good all right so next is children of june by mr frank herbert you might have heard of it so i did do a review of this on the channel i think the the my main observation or one, or one of the observations that i gave in that review was that the best thing i can say about children of june is that it gives june itself a run for its money yes much more so than june messiah in fact it had more of a june vibe to it uh, there's a lot more sort of fremen in the desert action um i enjoyed the p- political intrigue it goes large on the political intrigue there's a lot of plotting and counter plotting jessica's back on the scene uh after sort of spending june messiah sort of camped out on um on caladan their sort of atreides homeworld. she she's in the mix and plotting with the with the best of them um somewhat with Bene Gesserit goals in mind. Duncan Idaho, the golem that was introduced, reintroduced in Jim Messiah, is, is there too, also plotting. Alia, Paul Atreides' sister, she's the, um, she's battling and losing against the internal dialogue in her head, having consumed the water of life. She's got all of her ancestors in her head, as as do Paul's children. Um, Ganimar and Leto the second, and um, so Alia's losing that fight and. She, she ends up being controlled or possessed by one of those ancestors and, and of all the ancestors that she could possibly have, have been possessed by it's the one you really wouldn't want to be possessed by and so she goes she goes um 
it's the, really the story of uh, Alia Breaking Bad, really. Leto and Ganema, they're kids, but, but because of all of their ancestors in their heads, they run rings around the adults. I like that um, part of the story. There are various other sort of Fremen shenanigans going on in the desert. There's um, ecological change with terraforming sort of taking hold and that has an impact on the worms and therefore the spice production. The former emperor, Shaddam IV, his family are sort of plotting as well. They want to regain their lost influence. So there's, there's like plots going all over the place and it's a bit difficult to see sometimes who's on whose side and who's plotting in concert with whom and to what end is a bit opaque sometimes. I think, um, you know, he's just Herbert keeping his guessing. But I liked it. My dilemma now is whether to kind of stick there or twist and go for the fourth one. I have read them all, all, all of the original six before, so it's not like I'm going to lose out by not reading them. But, but it has been a long time and I did enjoy revisiting um, with, with Children in June, so I might do the fourth one at least um, at some point in the future. If I'm not in a rush, you know, it's been 30 odd years since I read them last, so they can sit sit there and stew in my memory until um, until I get to them. Plenty of others to read that I haven't read at all, so one has to strike a balance. So next is, I think it's probably a dead heat. The one that I enjoyed the most this month, or last month in September, um, probably just edges out this one. So Blackout by Connie Willis was uh, a book I really enjoyed. It's pretty thick, but I ripped through it in no time. 600 pages um, didn't feel like a, um, a a big overhead. I, I also reviewed this on the channel. I, I'm i partial to a historical novel. I like history. I like World War II. And obviously I like science fiction. So if you can, you know, a Venn diagram uh, of those three, this sits right in the middle of the intersection of those three, those three sets. And, and I really enjoyed it. It's time travel. You can argue it's sort of barely science fiction. There's, there's a bit of time travel in it, but once the protagonists, and there are three of them, are sent back to 1940, they're kind of stuck there. So really for most of the book, it's really a historical novel and, and it's about the, they're immersed in the experience of 1940s Britain at war with Germany fighting alone things are pretty grim the British expeditionary forces is, is being pushed off the French coast by the Germans London is being bombed pretty much nightly hundreds of people thousands of people are made homeless and die and um, Germans are trying to terrorize the population children have been evacuated and sent to various places of safety or relative safety in the countryside and now our, our three time travel protagonists are um, are there to observe history but they end up getting more involved than they should um, always worried that they're somehow going to be able to influence the timeline and change history which they shouldn't be able to do the, the sort of principle of time travel should prevent that but that's what that's their worry because things haven't been going quite as they normally would and so they're sort of beginning to doubt whether the kind of commonly held understanding of how this process works is actually wrong um, or doubt that it's right uh, I fear that it's wrong. And so you're always a bit, will they, won't they, sort of somehow do something, save somebody that, that later goes on to do something later in the war, which has a which has a material impact for good or ill on the outcome of the war and, and, and the knock-on impacts that that might have in the future. So that's that's a background peril as well as the peril of um, just being in a war zone. Quite a lot of the book is is spent with the three protagonists chasing around the country trying to find each other for various different reasons. They're they're kind of stuck there. They can't back can't get back to two thousand and sixty, um, and no one's come to get them. That would normally happen. Um, so something's gone wrong somewhere in the um, in the workings of the of the time travel process. So they spent a lot of time chasing around the country trying to find each other. Uh, eventually, like right at the very end of the book, successfully. But they still don't know what to do and so it ends a bit abruptly i mean it does it, it, it the i suppose the main thrust of the of this novel does play out quite nicely at the end but there's there's a lot of unanswered questions a lot of plot threads left untied and that is the subject of the second book which is all clear so they were really written as one story um they were published in the same year simultaneously and uh, so blackout is the first part and all clear is part two so that I will get to um, at some point. It's not on my list for October. I kind of forgot about it, actually. And now I'm beginning to regret my choices. But but I'll get to it um, soon. I liked it. So top of the heap for September, which I finished earlier in the um, middle of last week, is Use of Weapons by Ian M. Banks. It's the third of the cultural novels, and it's the third. I'm reading them in publication order um for the second or in some cases third or even fourth time so i have read them all before some of them more than once i think this one i've only well i've now read it twice but um the first time was 20 plus years ago so i didn't really remember much about it so 
if I've timed this right, there should be a review on the channel, perhaps published yesterday. But um, but in any case, we follow a guy called Zagalwi, who is a or was he's retired at the beginning of the book, a special circumstances agent whose specialty is he's a military specialist and he's employed by special circumstances to go into usually war zones but not always either where war is imminent and they want to prevent it or where war is war is already happening and they want to influence the outcome of it in ways that will ultimately prove their sort of ai minds calculate beneficial to the culture or or will or will um remove a future threat or, or whatever so there are there are two plot thre two threads running in the book. One is the Calway's past and sort of sweeping through his experience and his various missions that he's been on as a special circumstances agent, and then the other is in his present, which starts with him being re-recruited by special circumstances, kind of taken out of retirement, and uh, which he's not interested in doing at the beginning. He's like, I've, I'm done with that. I'm um, a peaceful chap now. But they dangle the promise of telling him where his sister now lives and he's really keen to see her um he's lost touch and he's she's his only surviving sibling it turns out so that and and they pay him a bunch of money as well so between between all of that that's enough of an enticement to take him out of retirement so the other thread follows him um getting to and carrying out this mission that he has um to influence the outcome of a, of a war on a planet it doesn't really matter which so the narrative is kind of broken um a bit like the way it turns out there's a there's a real shocker at the end that i'd kind of forgotten i didn't see coming um that i like sort of i was like oh my god i i hadn't um i hadn't seen it coming and although there were clues and um, it could have worked it out but um i um i was surprised by i'm still a little bit surprised by it now i do like ian banks's writing i like the scale of the culture i like the contrast between the culture as a sort of post-scarcity utopia where everything is hunky-dory and everyone can do what they like um, no one lacks for anything and um it's uh it's the sort of culmination of thousands of years of, of social experiments and it's all good um, but i like the contrast between that and the um morally ambiguous means that the culture employs it at its edges via special circumstances to to tweak sometimes quite dramatically the outcome of battles or political shenanigans to topple empires or whatever it might be that's going to result in a benefit to the culture so i like that i like that contrast in it and it in this book it's really um really played out and really clear so that's my top dog for for september so that was september um i'm looking forward to october i did the october tbr last week you can go and have a look at that but let me know so how did you get on in september what did you read what uh, what floated your boat last month uh, do let me know in the comments um, but otherwise thanks for watching as always and until the next video bye for now